Hello, here we will look at um, Eisenstein primes. These Eisenstein integers which are not a product of um, non-units of other Eisenstein integers, uh, both uh, non-units. Just to remind where we are operating, so we are looking at Result, the result of attaching cubic roots of 1 to the uh, set of integers. So that is uh, as good as attaching just one of these interest, uh, one of the non-trivial cubic roots, calling it epsilon. And basic arithmetic is controlled by the square of that, which is negative 1, negative epsilon. So anything is just an integer combination of 1 and epsilon. and the uh, rules of arithmetic were discussed in the previous video. So now we are in looking for, the, um, for those primes and um, the basic tool is this norm which is the product of Eisenstein number in its conjugate which is, happens to be a complex conjugate and that is always an integer. So in terms of, the, uh, of this form the explicit answer is like that. So it is a squared, b squared, and negative ab. And it is always a non negative integer. But um, yeah, what is important is this multiplicative structure. So now we're assuming that q is a prime. And q is an Eisenstein number. And um, then um, we will look at its norm and see what are the possibilities. And there are only two possibilities, so let's see um, what are they. Let's imagine a prime dividing the norm, because uh, there will be one. If the norm is 1, then it is a unit, and we put them aside. And there are six units, and uh, if the norm is non-1, then there will be prime divisors. So let's pick up one of those. Uh, but uh, then the product of these two primes in Eisenstein integers will uh, um, be this norm. And so one of them will have to divide p, because uh, there are primes in Eisenstein integers and p might not be. But yeah, in any way, um, if we have just two primes in, in, in the product and then we know that, so let me just write it, q and q conjugate is equal to p times something else. U, not U, maybe uh, Y. Why? So that um, is a factorization. That is a prime factorization. Q or Q conjugate have to divide, one of them has to divide P. Let's um, assume that Q divides P, because after all they just differ by conjugation. But yeah, immediately we see it because P is an integer, Q conjugate divides P. So they both divide. And now these are the two possibilities. The first possibility is that q and p are proportional up to an invertible Eisenstein integer, up to a unit, so they're equivalent. And then p it will be also a prime, an Eisenstein prime. So that is the first possibility. The second possibility, that they're not. And then uh, both q and q conjugate, which are going to be different, will have to divide p. And that means that the product of them will have to be p, just p. So that case is when y is equal to 1. Um, because otherwise we will have too many factors. q and q prime divide into p neatly, so nothing will divide into y. Well, it has to be 1. So that is the second case when uh, q and q prime in the product coincide with p. And now we just have to distinguish between the two cases. So which integer primes are in which category? And here is uh, a little algebraic trick. So let's take our Eisenstein integers and mod out everything which is a multiple of p. So 
So that will be um, a set of Eisenstein numbers where a and b are both divisible by p. That will be um, as good as just taking the um, integers mod p and attaching them this epsilon which uh, satisfies uh, this rule. That is to say that epsilon squared plus epsilon plus 1 is equal to 0. And um, that, after all, was um, a um, factor in the decomposition of epsilon cubed minus 1. And we assume that epsilon is not 1, so that uh, really a factor which can be ignored. But uh, from that point of view, it is easy to analyze um, um, uh, the arithmetic in this quotient um, because we can have two distinct situation, the situations. Um, that p can have a root of this polynomial, which is non-one uh, non root of this polynomial, or it can not. So when it doesn't have roots of this polynomial, this will become uh, a field. If it does, then we will have a factorization, we will have zero devices, we won't have a field. And uh, fields are important because these are the fields are the result when we quotient by a prime. So the first case, when p is a prime, let's call it, um, so this p, the, um, the um, integer prime, just the ordinary prime, which we took here. So let's call it a non-split case. And this will be split. So this uh, prime in integers becomes non-prime in Eisenstein integers. And uh, that's what we can um, effectively distinguish uh, between here, because if we quotient by p, and if p was a prime, then that has to be filled. So that means that uh, there will be no roots inside the coefficients of this polynomial. That's a trick. But uh, this polynomial is easier to analyze. So the roots of this polynomial inside this um, integers mod p will be elements of multiplicative order 3 non-trivial roots. And that is uh, just exactly the roots in here. So we're really interested in looking at the multiplicative group of integers mod p. And we know what it is. As a group, it is cyclic. So there's always a generator and the order of that generator will be p minus 1. And we want to see if we have elements of order 3 in this group. And uh, the condition is that the order of that element, 3, will have to divide the order of the group. So to have them, to have a split case, we should have 3 dividing p minus 1. And in other cases, we will have non-split case. So when 3 doesn't divide p minus 1, we have this case. So that is the dichotomy, that is the distinction between two cases. And, um, yeah, so what it says uh, is if um, P is congruent to 2 mod 3 or if P is 3 itself, then we're in the first case and that prime is uh, non-split. And... Uh, Otherwise, if p is congruent to 1, mod 3, then it will split into a product into a product of two primes. So we can analyze now small values of the norm, because the norm is the easiest way to arrange, um, organize them all. Uh, and when the norm is 1, well, they're not really technically primes, but they are units, and we Describe them before and they're plus minus 1, plus minus epsilon, plus minus 1 plus epsilon. There are 6 of them, 6 points on the unit circle of radius 1. On the complex plane, but in terms of our norm, we are finding um, norm 1 elements and the coordinates are plus minus 1, 0, coordinates in A and B, so coordinates in this coordinate system, AB coordinate system, plus minus 0, 1, 
plus minus 1 comma 1. So then uh, norm 2 is not possible because um, uh, that would mean uh, that uh, 2 is a product of Q and Q conjugate uh, but uh, the product of Q and Q conjugate has to be um, split then, so 2 has to be split, but uh, 2 is not split. So 2 is, uh, is, is not occurring as the norm, 3 is occurring as the norm, it's a non-split case, and uh, then we just need to find a um, uh, Eisenstein integer with a norm 3. Just one um, such, and then we could see all others. Um, so one of them we already um, uh, saw before, so that was, uh, say, 1 plus 2 epsilon. And that uh, was uh, uh, in, uh, uh, appearing in the, pre in the computation in the previous week. But yeah, it's just 1 and 2. Uh, substituted in the norm equation will give us 1 minus 2 plus 4 so the total will be 3 and uh, the decomposition should be in to this and it's conjugate right and the conjugate was um, negative 1 negative 2 epsilon so that is um, one solution that is one of the primes that is this conjugate but we could compute all other by um, um, really multiplying with norm 1 things because norm 1 elements will not change the norm of any of these factors. So we had uh, Q, Q conjugate, and then we can multiply any of them by 6 units. So we um, theoretically should have uh, 6 times 2, 12 solutions. But uh, what will happen is that we're going to have less than that in this case. We're going to have just 6 solutions because um, let's see what they are so they are um, plus minus one two but now we can quickly see what happens so we can switch two and one because they are featuring symmetric they in uh, this norm formula so we have two and one and uh, we um, cannot have just four again we can multiply by any of our six units, so we should uh, have them in packages of six, either six or twelve. Uh, but um, uh, if we multiply, say, epsilon uh, with um, um, this q, uh, then we will have epsilon plus. 2 epsilon squared and, and epsilon squared is negative 1 negative epsilon so we'll have epsilon and then negative 1 negative negative 2 negative 2 epsilon so that will become negative 1 and then just negative epsilon so that is another pair it is um, 1 plus epsilon and uh, in coordinates it will be 1 1 and that already I cannot um, duplicate by swapping coordinates a and b so um, I have 6 and um, I'm claiming that that is all what I can have um, so it can be just um, by exam can be um, approved by examining sort of substituting small numbers but it can also be seen by multiplying all our six units with any of the um, q and its algebraic conjugate. Uh, there will be a um, yeah there will be a um, um, relation between um, q and q conjugate there will be a multiple of q which is um, the q conjugate and that's why we only have six. So then um, after 3 comes 4, and 4 is um, uh, a valid value of the norm, uh, but uh, that is because it is a square, so we can just write 4 is 2 times 2, and uh, then um, all 
other solutions will be multiples of um, 2 and uh, 1 of our units. So there will be plus minus 2 comma 0, plus minus 0 comma 2, and then plus minus 2 comma 2. Uh, after comes 5, and 5 is a prime which is um, uh, congruent to 2, so it is non-split, and so the norm uh, 5 is impossible. And uh, the same for 6, because 6 is a product of 2 and 3, and 2 is impossible. And the uh, next possible is 7. And 7, we can... Um, yeah, we can make 7 by taking, say, 2 minus epsilon. That is of... Uh, that is of uh, norm 7. So if we substitute, we'll have 4, we'll have positive 2, and we'll have 1. So it'll be uh, 6, and 1 will be 7. And uh, that means that we can take plus minus, and we can take plus minus negative 1, comma 2. And then what is the conjugate of that? So the rule of conjugation, we take a minus b, so that will be minus minus 1, it will be 3, and then minus b, so minus minus 1 again, it will be epsilon. So that is the conjugate of that. That gives us two more solutions, 3, 1 and then 1, 3. And uh, this time we're going to have all 12 solutions because um, what can we do? We can multiply, say, with epsilon and see what happens. 2 minus epsilon. So that will be um, 2 epsilon and again negative epsilon squared. So negative epsilon squared is 1 plus epsilon. So we have 1 plus 3 epsilon. Oh, that's already here, that we already accounted for. So, um, uh, what else can I do? I can multiply with uh, 1 plus epsilon. So, let me um, multiply in 1 plus epsilon, uh, 2 minus epsilon. I just need to add 2 minus epsilon to this. So, that will be 3 uh, 3 plus 2 epsilon. And that is um, uh, another quadruple of solutions. 3 and 2, plus or minus, uh, together, or, or plus or minus 2, 3. Uh, 2, 3. Uh, indeed, if we substitute 3 and 2, so we'll have 9 and 4, but we'll have negative 6, so that will be seven in total. And that are all uh, possible, the maximum number of solutions for the given norm, um, for the given prime norm. All possible uh, um, uh, 12 solutions. So that's it. Um, see you later. Bye.